Entering into the 20th century, ocean liners continued to evolve at a rapid pace. In 1902, J.P. Morgan founded the International Mercantile Marine Company, which consisted of American shipping lines. With this, he bought out the White Star Line and the Leyland Line. The Cunard Line, on the other hand, became the main line of Britain to the point where they financially supported them. In terms of speed, Germany ships took the top spot, with Britain not competing in that category until the introduction of the Lusitania class in 1907. British lines like the White Star Line more so focused on size, with the Big Four being the first ships beating the Great Eastern in that category. In 1905, Cunard came to the British government asking for support for building two ships that would be the biggest and fastest in the world. These ships would be the Lusitania and Mauritania, which would be the first major ocean liners to incorporate turbine engines as the number one source of power. These ships would make the previous main engine, the reciprocating engine, obsolete, being able to generate more power while causing less vibration in the right hands. Both the Lusitania and Mauritania won the Blue Ribbon many times and kept it until the introduction of the Normandy in 1935. With this major achievement, White Star Line wanted a piece of that pie, and in late 1907, they ordered the Olympic-class liners, which would also be the largest in the world. The first one in the class, Olympic, launched in 1911 and had a very good career, with only a few big accidents. Her sister, the Titanic, though, would not have this, because in April of 1912, she sank on her maiden voyage, with a loss of 1,500 passengers out of the 2,000 on board. From her disaster came many new regulations, like the new requirement of 48 lifeboats instead of 16 like before. It also prompted many new safety changes that would be implemented on her sister Britannic, which would be built two years later. Just two months after this disaster, Germany completed the first of a trio of liners named the Imperator class, which would take over the Olympic in size, becoming the new largest ship in the world. It would remain this way for 20 years as well, with the Normandy yet again taking this title away from her when she was launched in 1932. In 1914, tensions were rising in Europe, and the beastly conflict happened that we know today as the World War I. So in order for the countries involved in the war to transport troops, they came up with an idea of troop ships. The idea was to convert massive ocean liners to big troop ships that can carry troops to different parts of the world. But first, the British Admiralty requested that ocean liners were to be built the requirements that would be used as auxiliary cruisers. Now, this obviously failed as one, they were too big, two, they had no armor, and three, they were basically useless. So, the Admiralty needed a new way to use these ships in the war, so they used them as troop transports. Some famous examples of these are the HMT Olympic, HMT Mauritania, and HMT Aquitania. So, Britain and Germany were the main countries that possessed troop ships, as they were the main countries that possessed the most ocean liners. Now, in order to convert those auxiliary cruisers to troop ships, they had to add one, more safety features such as more lifeboats, two, they needed powerful armament to at least protect themselves against enemy ships, and three, they also needed to be converted so that they could hold more people. And additional to this, later in the war, they also made a really cool camouflage called Dazzle. Now, the whole point of Dazzle was to distort and confuse the enemy ship or submarine into which direction the ship was headed. And also, this camouflage was also pretty effective, but this wasn't that effective as very soon, in the post-war, countries of the world already invented radar, and now they could detect ships much easier. So, troop ships were pretty effective in the war, taking part in lots of campaigns and transporting many troops across the oceans. The First World War left many shipping lines without ships. For example, the Cunard Line lost their beloved Lusitania and Carpathia to German U-boats, and the White Star Line lost their Britannic to a mine. In 1919, the Allies forced Germany to sign the Treaty of Versailles. This would force Germany to give up much of their ships to the Allies, such as all three of the Imperator-class ships. Cunard got the Imperator, while White Star Line got the Bismarck. America also got its share, though, with the already seized Vaterland. They all gave their new ships appropriate new names as well, with the Imperator being renamed Berengaria, Waterland being renamed Leviathan, and Bismarck being renamed Majestic. Olympic and Mauritania were quickly put back into service after a long overdue restoration. 
The Leviathan was put back into service as the flagship of the United States, but was not very popular. There are many reasons for this, but the most obvious one is the fact that it's an American ship. Since Prohibition was still in effect during this time, you were not allowed to have alcohol on board any American registered ships, and since alcohol is such a big commodity on ocean liners, most people would just book a trip for a British or German ship. Speaking of German ships, they were back, with the SS Bremen and SS Europa, which were very fast, capturing the Blue Ribbon from the Mauritania after 20 years. Italy also joined the scene, with the SX Rex, which broke the record for luxury and speed in 1932. In the same year though, France launched the SS Normandy, which also won the Blue Ribbon in 1935. In 1929, after years of booming stocks, they suddenly took a nosedive. We now know this as the Great Depression, which hit every company hard. Much less people were booking for trips across the Atlantic during this time, which put every shipping line in critical. In 1934, the Cunard Line and White Star Lines were forced to merge. On the same day, the RMS Queen Mary was launched, and would take the Blue Ribbon from the Normandy twice. Sadly, many beloved ships had to be sold for scrap because of the financial pressure. Ships like the RMS Olympic and Mauritania saw this fate, and were sent out to the breakers. The public didn't take this kindly though, and protested on scrapping them, specifically the Mauritania. Even Franklin D. Roosevelt called, protesting or scrapping. Sadly though, there really wasn't anything Cunard White Star Line could do, since it would cost too much money to convert them into museum ships. World War II, just like the first one, left many shipping lines without their flagships. The Normandy, for example, was stuck in an American port until America attempted to convert her into a troop ship, even though they didn't know much about her design. When a fire started on board, the American troops were unable to do anything about it. She burned to death, which was a complete loss to her owners. The Queen Elizabeth was completed during the war and was instantly converted into a troop ship, serving with her running mate, the Queen Mary. After the war, she was finally able to make her main voyage, which was very successful. The US, impressed with these ships, launched the SS United States in 1952, which became the fastest ship in the world, being able to go a maximum speed of 38 knots, which was much faster than the Queen Mary. World War II had caused the development of many new aircraft, which were fast and well protected. In 1953, the Boeing 707 became the first jet airliner to start making regular travel carrying a high number of passengers. Since aircraft were much faster and more efficient compared to ocean liners, there really wasn't much of a reason to continue building them. By the 1960s, most ocean liners like Cunard's Queen Elizabeth were now being used as cruise ships, which would slowly happen to most if not all the leftover ocean liners. If not meeting this fate, they would be scrapped or just sold. A few old ocean liners, though, would be sent to be preserved as museum ships, like the Queen Mary. As of now, there's only one still in service today, being the Queen Mary II of Cunard Line. Ocean liners met a very sudden fate, continuing to evolve until the introduction of something better, then being sold off for scrap or being used for a purpose they are not built for. Ocean liners like the Queen Mary II might still be around today, but to me and most other people, they're all gone, now somewhat mistaken for cruise ships. At least though, we have people like the Naval Guy, who have used their YouTube channel to spread their knowledge on these truly historical icons.